tell me, I mean, you're always ahead of the curve in terms of what, what we should be looking at. What should we be looking at now? Well, I, 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 of course, the, from my point of view as a historian of, of Eastern Europe, it's, it's obvious that the big story right now is Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But I think there may be an even bigger story lurking underneath which has to do with the fact that Ukraine, literally for thousands of years, has been a place which has fed much of the rest of the world. And so the, the underlying bigger story seems to me to be the blockade of the Black Sea, that Russia, in attacking Ukraine, has also blocked all of Ukraine's maritime exports. And since Ukraine is the fourth or fifth biggest exporter of food in the world, if this doesn't stop, it's going to mean hunger and I'm afraid literally starvation for tens of millions of people in Asia and Africa before this year is over. You wrote on tyranny, you wrote about what's happened here. Madeleine Albright came out in 2018 with fascism, like warning us uh -huh. of fascism. How would you describe the state of the world today? Well, it's a, I think the, the state of the world today is one in which those of us who care about things like freedom and equality and democracy have to articulate these values and, and take a stand. Um, if there's any positive, if there's anything positive to take from the war in Ukraine, it's the reminder to the rest of us that there are values which is worth taking risks for. So I don't think democracy is doomed. I don't think freedom and equality are doomed. I just think that there, there are larger forces which we have to see and to recognize. We have to, we have to realize that history is not on their side. History is on nobody's side. Um, and that it depends upon us to see these problems get out ahead of them. I'm neither an optimist or a pessimist. I'm a historian. There are lots of things that can happen, um, things that we don't expect. And I, I see the problems that we're facing now as a challenge. So use the word fascism. Fascism is real. There are plenty of fascists out in the world right now. Um, I, I like the word tyranny. It's an old classical word. It describes the behavior of a lot of leaders right now, including Vladimir Putin. I'm from a big flawed democracy. My big flawed democracy is at risk. It could go down in the next couple of years, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. If we recognize the problems, we can address them. And in, in that sense, um, I look at things, um, I hope, with a, with a clear eye and with the, with, with the belief that that those of us out here, out, out there who care about these things can make a difference. Last question. I mean, sure. you have both the history and you've written large tomes of what we can learn from it, but you've also written a short 150 page book called On Tyranny. So mm -hmm. if you, we want to protect our democracies, what do we do now? Yeah, well, the two things go together, right? So I could write the little tiny book called On Tyranny because I'd written all the history books. And what history teaches us is that there are structures and you have to know what the structures are. The structures constrain you, but they also give you opportunities to act. So if we want to save our democracies, we have to look at our democracies and say, what are the flaws? Where are the structural problems? How are the people who want to bring democracy down taking advantage of those structural problems? We have to see things from their point of view first and then try to solve the structural problems, and then try to solve, and then try to set an example. And above all, I think maybe one thing which is missing is that those of us who like democracy have to be willing to say, hey, this is actually a better system. It's not just something which is under threat, or it's not just something which we can take for granted. It's actually much better than the alternatives, better in pretty much every possible way. I think that mood, like that sort of buoyant spirit that the thing that we're defending or trying to create or trying to extend is actually good. I think that's missing a little bit. So that's, I guess that's the, what, what I close on, that democracy is just a better system. And um, it, it, in the 21st century, it's not that there's no alternative. There are plenty of alternatives. It's just that none of them is nearly as good. <laughs> okay, I should have one last last. Right. For the Philippines, Tim, you know, we just elected 36 mm -hmm. years after people power. Ferdinand Marcos yeah. Jr. is back. He is our president-elect. Words of advice for us. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, you know, you're, you're, you, 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 you were you and I'm me, and it's crazy for me to be giving you advice in that situation. I'll just say general things like support the reporters who are out there trying to tell the truth. There's no way we can have democracy in the Philippines or anywhere else without the reporters. When the reporters go quiet, then 
a democratic system is going to fall because it will immediately become corrupted from inside. Um, be active in the non-governmental organizations, create the civil society that's between the government and the people because that middle layer is what makes makes change possible in the long run, whether it's the Philippines or, or anywhere, anywhere else.